that almost worked. My apologies. Computer sound is the key part. Lucidia is a global software developer with a commitment to providing purpose-built collections management systems to galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Argus is our unrivaled web-based CMS for museums of all sizes and budgets. Argus is engaging, immersive, innovative, essential. Museum Collections Management, limited only by your imagination. Argus. Excellent. So uh, thank you uh, to our sponsors and welcome to everyone who's here um, in the room for our session today. Uh, rewriting your digital plan, getting your tech situation in shape. I want to say that if you have questions for us as we go through, our agenda today, we have um, both questions on the app and then there, I think, wait, is there a Q&A feature? I don't even see the Q&A feature, but we do have questions that are coming in on the app that we will address as we go forward. Jane, let me turn it over to you. Next slide. All right. Hi, welcome. Um, I'm Jane and I'm AVP at uh, Arts Consulting Group. We'll go through our introductions in a moment, but I just wanna thank you all for having us here today uh, with our presentation on your digital strategy. What's next for your museum? Uh, sure, and I'm Wyona Lynch McWhite, Senior Vice President Arts Consulting Group. Go ahead, you can go to the next one. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but we also like to tell people why folks that um, have done sessions on perhaps things like hiring and so forth. They're also doing this kind of thing. But Arts Consulting Group is a full service management consulting firm uh, based in the U.S. and Canada. And these are some of our locations and our broad commitment to the sustaining work of the arts and culture industry. We can go to the next one. So today, just to give us a little bit of framing, we only have an hour. And these are some of the topics we really hope to discuss. We're going to talk a little bit about how museums are making money in this time of crisis. That's something that we've heard a lot of people would like to get a kind of a survey on. We'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about externally what your lockdown audience is looking like, some of their key issues and concerns. We'll also talk about kind of your lockdown staff as well. So we'll talk about the both of them. And we're going to also talk about revenue opportunities in virtual content based on a scan of the industry. Um, Jane will be driving most of our ch conversation today. Excuse me. I'll be facilitating our conversations and jumping in. But again, if you do have questions, remember to please send them to us. We're going to try to allow at least five, maybe 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. All right, Jane, I'll turn it over to you. All right, so um, I'm actually going to use this slide first uh, before we get to the colorful stem. But I wanna talk about how at ACG, you know, during the lockdown and after the reopening, and now we're looking at another lockdown possibility, um, we're looking at all the arts industries and what everyone's been doing different, you know, we want to learn from each other. So a lot of the data that we've collected for this presentation is museum focused, but it's really helpful for us to learn from our other friends in the arts, performing arts centers, uh, classical music world. Um, we have also uh, the theater world, dance and opera world. Um, and, you know, here's a list you'll see of the different types of virtual content available at a lot of museum sites. Um, and these are types of contents that you, you've been familiar with before, right? So this is not necessarily because of lockdown, then you have artist interviews or the audio guide or the museum tours but we're rethinking about how to pivot and use them. So for instance, you can be more regularly scheduled, there could just be more of them. And now we're talking about, okay, you know, as museum people, we all love to show off our wonderful space collection, our vision um, to as many visitors as possible, free as possible, right? So yes, that can all be available for people, but then how to leverage those opportunities for more donations, contributions, engagement, leading up to people who will pay for content and how that works. Okay, so we're actually gonna go here, right? And just to review the revenue word um, in our museum world could be earned or contributed. Uh, so with earned revenue, we're talking about that single action of buying something. 
buying a ticket for a program, for admission, for a special event. Um, it could be buying merch from the shop. Uh, we'll have some stylish uh, items that some museums are coming up uh, with later on. Um, it can also be buying you know, food from the cafe, right? And then we're talking about contributed revenue opportunities. So that's the suggested donation contribution. Could be something very minimal, a dollar just uh, in recognition of providing this wonderful free content. Or it could be $1,000 for your contribution for a virtual gala. So anything along those lines where it's generated by a donation from an individual or an organization. So we'll look at those two models. There are so many examples here and it was really hard to choose. So this is kind of providing you an overview. Some of these examples are it's all virtual content that can be contributed or earned um, and it can change, it's been changing. So for example, uh, with the virtual museum tours at the Met, uh, there are so many ways to access those tours in the sense that um, there's free online tours for you to check out the massive collection. Uh, there's ways to purchase a tour for your private group. And there's also ways to contact them to see if they could scale the price of their tour. So, you know, not everyone can be the Met, of course. I've worked at many museums and there's always that conversation, oh, the Met does this, how can we compare to them? But it's just an idea that there's different price points for one, a simple idea of providing a video tour of your space. Um, going to the audio guide, something we always talk about museums, that audio guide pickup rate, we work so hard on those things and it's like a two or 3% pickup rate. Um, but at the new museum recently, they noticed a huge um, bounce, uh, a generation of their pickup rate based on um, the fact that they don't have a collection, but they have a huge network of contemporary artists. So they asked Maurizio Catalan to uh, contact his fellow artist friends to create these bedtime stories. Um, we're all zoomed out, right? Thank you for being here. But you know, video is sometimes too much. And these audio guides are terrific, something simple. We all need to chill, <laughs> especially at night before we go to bed. And these can be two minutes, they can be half an hour. You can listen to Michael's study. You can listen to a contemporary artist you, you don't know about, but maybe you saw their show. They, you know, they have some interesting ideas. So I think that's a really great way of engagement. It's free at the moment, but there are some potential there for earned uh, revenue. Now, Jake, are these Matt, downloaded from their site? I want to make sure I ask the yeah. question for those in the audience. Are they just downloaded from the site or are people listening on the site? Um, they are listening from the site. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe they are on SoundCloud. Sound, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I won't go through all of them. I just want to highlight, I just love this idea that LACMA, okay, so they have full virtual content that's museum-based. But now they're going into their second lockdown. I've noticed they switched immediately to LACMA at home. So when you get to their website, it seems like almost has that Netflix feel where it's a lot of online entertainment that's easily um, scroll, you know, scroll through and see what's happening. But it's getting into lifestyle. So it's the museum brand of contemporary art. But you're curating, you know, they have these playlists curated by artists for your yoga class or for your walk with a dog or while you're cooking. And I think that's a really great way of extending into lifestyle. Um, gala boxes, I'm sure all of you have attended one or two fundraisers online and they're very popular ways to generate income with, you know, having a great uh, low entry point for a gala. Many people can't attend or afford a chair or a table at a gala. Uh, but now you have an opportunity and as an organization, you can offer as many seats as possible right? Um, and some organizations uh, like the Cooper Hewitt are mailing home gala kits. So you can have a drink or some kind of um, merchandise from the museum or donor uh, and participate in this gala at a pretty decent price point. Um, one example down I have down at the bottom from American Museum of Natural History I thought was really interesting. As we've been watching these organizations develop their virtual content strategies, you know, when we first locked down, People just wanted visitors to continually engage. Don't forget us, we're the Museum of Natural History, right? Um, they don't want you know, the kids to stop coming even if it's online and all the content was free. And I've noticed they've pivoted to then some of their content. There's definitely a lot of free content still available, but a lot of their online programming now has a minimum. So it's not free. 
and it's $15. And it's interesting that they notate her household. So you're not paying for yourself, you know, and all your kids, that's 15 times how many, but it's for everyone, right? You download Mulan from Disney Plus, that's 30 to some dollars, but you get everyone over to watch it at once. So it's interesting, they have a decent minimum, but they also have a suggested donation of $25. Um, and strategically, a lot of museums are keeping that as a cap of the full adult mission with the actual museum price. So there's some kind of strategy with not making it more than what it would cost for adults to attend at full price in person. Um, at least that's the strategy right now. Hey, Jane, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Looks like folks are helping to answer. Thank you for that. Someone asked, what Great. is LACMA? which means we're, I forgot that we should break down um, lingo. So the Met <laughs> is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. That's correct. Where, where Jane is based. The new museum is also in New York City. LACMA is the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in LA. Um, the Cooper Hewitt Museum, New York. I almost gave him a different location. SF MoMA is the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. The Bruce Museum is in Greenwich, Greenwich Connecticut. Uh, ICA, was this one the, um, in Boston, the Institute of Contemporary Art? Yes. And then, of yes. course, the American Museum of Natural History, also in New York City. All right. Yes. And, you know, call out to the Bruce Museum for using their archives, right? Um, and they uh, launched their first online exhibition ever with materials they already have. So that was very clever. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Jane. thank you for your comments and questions. So specific to earn revenue examples, um, call out to Anima Museum, the Peabody Essex. I love that mask in the center, the serpent mask. And so th these are ways that, you know, museum merchandise is such a clever connection to engagement with the museum website. We're already buying kind of everything we need online. So it's almost like a natural progression. Okay, we can support the museum by looking in their shop. Maybe you would have gone in person before, and now you have these online opportunities. So how are they making this specific to the time period? A lot of museums are using popular items from their collection. They have the rights to the images and producing masks. It's the way that we can show our unique faces these days, right? So on the left is a mask from artist Catherine Obi at LACMA, Los Angeles County <laughs> Museum. And then the middle from the Peabody Essex, the serpent illustration. And one of the most popular Monet pieces from uh, the Detroit Institute of Art. It's a beautiful mask and one of their best sellers. Um, there's also museums like the Museo del Barrio in New York selling artist editions. Um, and Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. So they have these fantastic uh, adult education programs like an online book club, art classes. Some are free and some are paid. But I think what's really clever is there's an immediate link to getting the supplies or supply kits in their store. Excellent. And I'll just say as we keep going through the process, please note that there are a lot of museums that have leveraged uh, some of these kind of, let's call them at home or take home uh, pieces, some just for community building, but many of them have tried to monetize them. And in the if you have questions, we can try to talk about what it takes there. Please know that we're giving you lots of ideas so that you know what's out there and so forth. But the intricate steps of what you might need to do to create one of them certainly depends on where your institution is in its current digital plan. So let's keep going. Okay. All right, so here's some images, uh, images from the education department. This is really an opportunity during lockdown for museum education areas to shine and provide um, these kits for you know, families of all ages. And I wouldn't limit this just for kids, right? Um, but these are from children's museums. I would love to have one of these. Um, Greensboro Children's Museum, uh, Children's Museum of Pittsburgh, and the Everhart Museum, they're nature kits. They, they happen to be located in a, a park. Uh, has sold out, um, I think, believe by the beginning of April, and they weren't expecting that, and their price point was $25, including shipping for the kit and lesson plan. So these um, are connected to free lesson plans online. Um, on the left, you see from the Museum Lab in Pittsburgh, they have a children's uh, museum cooking kit, how to make spaghetti and meatballs, and that's something everyone can enjoy. So these are 
items that you can create out of the resources that you might already have for your lesson plans available in the education department. And um, I love these because they're also evergreen. They don't necessarily tie to a specific time period exhibition cycle. So you can bring these back um, as you need them. Um, I wanted to um, show an example from Museum the Louvre uh, across the ocean because they're in their second museum lockdown right now, and um, they found a lot of success. They've been doing everything with the virtual contents, certainly the tours, and they offer something like 20 multiple languages for all their audio guides. So they have that international reach. But how are they engaging with their local visitors? Um, and they are in a park, and I think a lot of your organizations are you know, in outdoor locations where no matter what kind of lockdown we're in, you're allowed to take, you know, take a walk, take your pets, take your family to the park. And they've seen such a huge success uh, for their sponsor tree or bench program. Um, their tree program actually sold out of sponsorships. It, it's lucky for them the trees are you know, set in a line, so it's really easy to see. But when you go to their website, um, you can actually scroll on each tree and take a look at who uh, sponsored this, this particular tree. And, and I think it's a fabulous idea for um, anyone to feel like they're taking part in um, helping this, the museum and be able to see what you're, you know, what you sponsored outdoors. It's really great. Any last questions um, about before we pivot to uh, your lockdown audience? I think you're good. We did not have any more of those questions, but they may come back in Q&A. Absolutely. Okay. So um, your lockdown audience, uh, there's two types, right? And it's not one or the other. So there's people visiting, continuing to visit museums in a different way. And there's people who are visiting virtually. And you know, this person might do both, they might change. I know that the feelings people have about how safe they feel in public spaces change day to day, location to location. So it's good to keep in mind, um, what are you thinking about when you're serving in-person and virtual visitors? So some general concepts for in-person visiting is, um, you know, the ability people have to plan the visit because there's capacity issues. And um, there's, because of that, we have time ticketing. So please make sure when we scan a lot of museums, also performing arts centers, that um, people aren't taking the time. You have your visitors signing up for a space so they can provide you something. You don't have to be too aggressive about it, but just an email. Um, or you can survey some, a simple question that, that could be an opportunity to engage that visitor, get them on your mailing list. Um, and then uh, there's demand pricing. There's, there's an interesting model at the Wesserberg Museum in uh, Germany where they actually have capacity levels. So it's almost like buying a plane ticket. The more people are going to be there, the, uh, the, more, the more popular times are more expensive and also they have uh, demand pricing with how long you stay. So it's not going to be more than the cost of a full adult price ticket. For them, it's nine euros. It's, it's, it's Germany, so you know they, they are subsidized. It's very different than the US. So nine euros is their maximum price, but if you wanna stay just for an hour, meet a friend for coffee, you may only need to pay two euros for your museum visit. And they actually notice that museum visitors should increase by 40%. Um, but their revenues from ticket sales did not change. And people felt like they had just the right amount you know, of time they needed for the museum, didn't feel pressured, like they had to make it into a full day event. Um, and we're also going to talk about our virtual visitors, right? So um, different price points for various types of virtual engagement online and also the reach of the audience that you get to serve. Okay, um, for virtual in-person visitors, um, we wanna talk about language clarity. I mean, when you, museum web websites have never been home to clarity in a sense, because we do have so much to show. We're very visual. Um, our exhibitions, our programming is constantly changing. There's a calendar. There's a lot for someone who doesn't work at the museum as a visitor to open the page and say, what is happening? How do they find where to go? 
right? So especially now, I mean, even when, let's say I need to go to see if I can get takeout at a restaurant, even finding out that information to see how updated that is, this is hard, right? So, you know, I really like Los Angeles uh, County Museum. They have LACMA at home, okay? It's not, it's a great way to indicate that these are virtual events. Also, you know, it's helpful when um, at MoMA, Museum of Modern Art New York, they specifically say live only. So there's no opportunity for you to, you know, attend this event um, online, it's only live. And, and that's helpful just so people know, mm -hmm. especially now when we may not have as much staffing to answer those emails or respond to those calls. Um, also, uh, ca captioning is really important for your online audience as um, people may have different windows open and also, you know, there's different language needed um, and marketing an online event and managing an online event. Just think about just because you have something online does not mean that you can't, you can go on autopilot, right? There's actually quite a lot of staff training and support uh, necessary to make sure that it's a great experience. People are you know, if people are not having a great experience in a museum, they might walk around, ask for help, just try to deal with it because they made it there. They found parking in the space. But if someone's not happy online, what do you do? Go to the next thing, right? They're just quick to leave. So you don't want that happening and you want it really clear how people can get help. Okay. So um, with interpretation and signage, museums are revamping just the experience as, as every public space, um, walking in, what to expect. Now we're used to seeing these signs all over the place, but don't assume that people have been going around in public. This could be somebody's first experience outside of their home. You never know. You can't assume that they've been on the train, they've been going to other museums, right? So, um, you know, Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, love that place. They are very popular families um, and it's full of regular times. And there are, I really like the signage they have. Um, it's a little hard to read, but I think the main uh, takeaway from this is there's a sign that says, here's what, we do, uh, what we're doing, right? Um, a lot of families visit and it's good for them to know, before we tell you what you have to do, can we just offer what we've been doing to provide a safe place for you, how we've updated our guidelines, what's new, um, and also what we're doing to make sure that you're having a great experience. Let me just add here, Jan. Oh, sorry. We want to just add, of course, this ties back to the keynote uh, presentation from earlier this week and the research that came out before that when everything was shut down, when people were surveyed to ask, you know, which cultural experience they were hoping to return to once that initial lockdown period ended, museums were rated quite highly above perhaps sitting shoulder to shoulder in a symphony um, or in a theater. But at the same token, everyone's made it clear that they want to know about the safety protocol. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, make sure it all connects, you know, the research shows it and successful institutions have been demonstrating it. So Jane, please go ahead. Oh, by the way, oh, I'm sorry, one quick question. When we, when we get a second, someone did ask, are we finding that museums are making more through suggested donations to an otherwise free virtual event rather than selling tickets with a ticket price? So I'll park that there and let you kind of finish in person and we can then talk about that. Okay, sure. Um, so here we, this is the signage we're used to seeing, right? So just to go back real quick, what we're doing, I think that's great to have available alongside with what we expect you to be doing. Mm -hmm. Wearing your fast, uh, mask, the distancing, uh, temperature checks. Um, I called this out from Institute of Fine Arts in Chicago because uh, they have this really great schedule here. Um, that has the capacity levels and what's been closed. So people know right away, you have to carry your coat. There's no, no food available in the cafe. So this should be something in your space, but definitely on the website. So people are aware of their, you know, what's expected of the visit. Um, and also, you know, it's really important on your websites to post. I've, I've been scanning a lot of museum websites and you have no idea when these changes were made. Were these made in March? Um, I've seen a few where, you know, they have a posting change every day. So you're aware that someone is updating the guidelines because um, I'm 
uh, calling you from New York City today, and we have no idea what's happening tomorrow with local businesses. So it's good to stay updated this time, uh, just so people know that this is new information. They may call and yeah, you're closed on that day or you don't have enough staffing to answer all those questions. Um, Peabody Essex Museum, they also have a way to pre-order their food online. And that's a great safe way to have you know, your wrapped food uh, for your visit and not have to worry about that. The Museum of Science of Boston, uh, they made a full video production. And this is something anyone can do. It, it actually uh, was about 10 minutes long and it seemed like it was made by staff, but it's really helpful. It seemed like, a, it worked like a social narrative to me where it literally had basically what it felt like to walk through the museum. And it, it's shot almost from a shorter perspective, but it's not, it's made for children and adults, but it had that feel of walking through the museum as a, a child. Uh, it's captioned and you show, they show different staff members wearing masks and visitors wearing masks the whole time they're speaking. Um, also in the Museum of Science, I thought was helpful that they have tours that are hybrid in nature in their parts. So you can have a, you can join them live for a tour either from your home or you can meet them in the park. And they state that very clearly so you understand what's happening. Uh, at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, I just thought it was lovely in their visitor site how they show families in different ways having fun at the museum. You know, children's museums are made for tactile engagement and they're all wearing their masks. I think that's really great. And it makes people, you know, aware that this is current content that uh, you've updated on your site. Okay. Um, so um, we're talking about virtual, virtual visitation now, kind of switching over to that. And um, what is a good virtual visit? Uh, I would love to hear your stories as patrons, as well as stories from your organizations of just, um, all, we're all learning here. It's all a process. And um, these are happening more regularly. So we get a little more practice with them. Um, I think it's helpful when I see trailers so I know what to expect. Uh, what does your virtual event, what does this look like? It's the first time I'm paying for a museum tour online. What's that going to be like? Um, I don't have any context for that. So having a little sample for your visitors is really helpful. Um, it's difficult to describe these things sometimes and a clear pricing structure. So that means if it's free, don't assume that people know that, right? Um, oftentimes I definitely see a price first, but if it's free, let them know. Um, it does not look bad if you have that word on, on your uh, website, it's, it's not a bad thing. Um, even if, I think what's difficult in museums is the free with, um, registration. So sometimes visitors get confused if they register or give the information. Does that mean it leads to paying for something? So just be very clear with your language. Um, also have your tech support available. And I've seen some uh, or organizations have multiple PDFs and links and people just have a simple link, have a si simple one sheet of the different steps people need to make um, to get on to these platforms. So um, whether you're using YouTube or Zoom or Facebook, people, Instagram video, um, don't assume that people understand how to use them. Also, I can I, this, uh, oh, yes. sorry, Jane. we also want to just remind those people in the audience who are likely creating these events, uh, when you're doing virtual visitation prep, you all need to test it on multiple browsers and platforms. I think um, we've learned through the hard way, some things just do not translate well to Safari or Firefox or Internet Explorer, or whatever. Google Chrome seems to be universally pretty good for a lot of things, but not everyone has them. So the other thing I just wanted to share is please remember as the people creating it, you need to try to try and sample it out and look at it in various operating systems as well. Sorry, Jane, please go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and also the way your program looks on a phone or a laptop may make a difference. So if it does make a difference, let people know uh, what is suggested. And I thought this was very clever. Um, museums are offering that experience of, you know, being there with them by providing uh, images. So this is the Seattle Art Museum on the left from their museum space. So if you're gathering, let's say for a museum book club, you can pretend like you're sitting together in their space. 
At the bottom, you have a period room from the Met. And then um, there's also from the Seattle Art Museum, the Odd Fellows, a very popular coffee shop in the museum. And so a lot of people like to hang out there and you can still go to your favorite hangout. And that's also a great way to promote images from your collection or promote uh, images from an upcoming exhibition. Creating Zoom backgrounds could be a real fun thing. Not necessarily monetized. Most people think it's free, but it's still a great way to build support. I like that one. I may change to the coffee shop for my next call. I like that. <laughs> I hear you're a coffee lover, Wyona. It's a bit of a problem, but I like this. I like it. <laughs> All right. All right. So, you know, this is really like a per thinking about your virtual event just like an in-person event. I mean, all of us have run those public programs and it takes, even if there's only 20 people showing up for your program, it could take a lot of uh, preparation. So providing a schedule for your visitors, what's happening, you know, if there's a certain time that they can't dial in anymore, please let them know. So they're not confused if they're 10 minutes late and they can't get into the event. It's just like saying, you know, when you have a live audience, when you're opening the doors, a lot of people, um, when they receive a Zoom link, might want to sign in early and realize, I can't get in, what's wrong? And have them understand that you're only opening the doors five minutes before the event, and they can just uh, sit and wait and get ready. Also, while somebody's waiting for the event, just like in the museum theater, um, you have that slideshow, right? Or you have the brochures and the chairs of what's happening next season, uh, where to get tickets for this exhibition, or here's a coupon for the shop. Um, use those five minutes while people are waiting to engage with your audience. Um, and have a moderator, have a host. This is a great opportunity for somebody who's emerging your programming department to host something, engage with visitors virtually. Um, at least have them uh, introduce people, what's happening. Sometimes there's no time for live captioning. Uh, people may not wear name tags. It's hard to see on the video um, screen or they might just have their name Jane. Who's Jane? What's she doing? I like this woman from LACMA. She's wearing a t-shirt. So you know that when she's popping on screen, she's part of the staff. I think um, that's really terrific. Just you can't uh, be more helpful outlining what's going on because it's really difficult uh, to focus your audience sometimes, especially if you're not the only thing happening in their world, right? You don't have them captive in a theater uh, sometimes uh, on virt in virtual world. So I have ushers, right? Make sure your staff is on chat for the questions. Um, you know, just to make sure that there's appropriate questions being asked to the content and um, intermissions. I think they're really important. A lot of virtual content is shorter in nature because it's difficult to engage people for longer than 45 minutes, one hour. But if it's a longer artist program, have a break and use that break for people to maybe have a community time to engage with each other or um, you know, the opportunity to just have their screens off for a few minutes, go do something so you can keep them around for the whole um, engagement rather than you, know, you don't wanna tire them out. I think we should mention that when you're doing, so the platform will depend on how you all do this. Please know if you're trying to use more of the freer versions of Zoom um, or the lower tiered versions, you have less flexibility with what happens as you're opening and closing kind of the doors uh, to the program and how you interact. And you're definitely gonna need a staff member to remove people from the meetings to avoid that Zoom bomb issue. They've added the waiting room purposely for that, but in an open program, it's still an issue. So um, not only is intermission necessary, ushers really will be doing their jobs because they're gonna have to kind of sometimes boot people out of the room if necessary, or mute people who have not turned their mics off, which is only the case if you're not doing a workshop format. All right, excellent. Yeah, I mean, this really follows along with how you would manage a live public event. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I know we have a lot of other materials to go through, but after the event, just like public events, make sure people have a time to provide feedback, ask questions, but it's so important. You already have people engage in this topic, in this artist, in this exhibition talk, and then give them a chance. Maybe this is the time you set up a Zoom cafe, have someone to monitor, but like give them a chance for people to have fun, just like you would be in the museum and talking to the person next to you in the theater, right? Or an opportunities for raffles, previews, exhibitions, um, provide a trailer for, for what other cool virtual content you have. You already have people game for it now. Uh, what else would they be interested in? Um, surveys, maybe there's an opportunity to get more information from your, um, if they can't make a contribution, 
this is a great way for you to learn more about your virtual audience and have them contribute, not necessarily with cash. Um, and also, you know, virtual can be accessible. I know there's uh, issues sometimes with getting to that digital uh, threshold, but then, you know, once you're virtual, we are finding across all the industries an enormous reach in um, audience nationwide and global who've never been through the doors of your museum or art center. Um, and it's affordable. We've seen people attend galas and programs that they may not have had the time or, or the money to attend in the past. And you know, with inaccessible spaces, um, Wyona, you were talking about historic homes, mm -hmm. gardens, all these wonderful places. There's people in my life I would love to take that I can't bring because it's difficult for them either with a wheelchair or to walk through all these spaces. Uh -huh. Here we have the Alice Austin House in Staten Island, New York, one of my favorite little places, but you have to take the ferry. You have to go up around the wharf. You have to go up the steps and you could see the landscaping is a little more to be desired, but it's part of the nature of the space. Um, and you know they have these great events, uh, this yearly event, for pugs because Alice Austin was a photographer who loved pugs and she invites him every year. Um, but you could see how they have really engaged people with the virtual tours of this house, Alice's photographs, and they partnered with Photoville Virtual uh, Photo Festival. So I think for a small space that actually a lot of people didn't get to go to, they're seeing a high level of visitorship this past year. Yeah, and that's a great point. Much of our properties, um, if they are historical or um, open space, uh, lots of property, in general, we don't think always about accessibility um, in the experience. But what digital does give us the chance to, to Jane's point, is to use the camera as a way to invite visitors who might have a limited mobility or might have trouble going up the stairs or accessing the full aspect of your property. This is a good thing, not just in COVID, but what COVID is helping people realize is, hmm, there's a whole lot of ways that we could explore our property um, and we just haven't done it. And this is true also for the visual arts museums, but I would just say for historic sites and people with large geographic property, that's important. I'm not sure if we have time to talk about it. Jane and I had so many references of other disciplines we wanted to share that time just doesn't allow, but please know uh, symphonies, theaters, other venues outside of the museum realm who have been doing live work um, virtual streaming and other things, uh, performances that are all that way, have seen a huge increase in their reach. People who have never been before, people who are not from um, the community at all, like international visitors, Eva, who are finding them online as they're looking for this content, which is a great way to expand audience. The conversion of that audience is a little more questionable, which is why it's really important to James' point earlier at the start, you need to figure out who is attending these events so that you begin, can begin to engage them. That's really important as it relates to this piece. Okay, I'll let you keep going. Oh, wait, wait. All right, one last point about our virtual audience, and this is really the next step. You know, now we're just talking about what we have, how we can develop what we have, but then going forward, you know, this is leading into that question of, should I do that 360 tour? What about AR? What about VR? And these are screenshots from VR experiences in museums. Um, I've had to develop VR experiences in uh, mostly art museums in New York, and it's it takes a long time, and it should be part of your permanent collection. It, it takes a long time to photograph everything 360, and it's not just that, but once it you have the product, uh, the platforms keep changing, and it's a Samsung versus Apple thing. So half your audience can't see what you produced unless they have the very thing. And if you give them the thing in the museum, you also need to train staff to use it because it's just still not in that space yet. So I wouldn't be so quick to jump on that. It's more of a longer term project and definitely something to consider. But think about what you have and assess what, what are, what's possible for you uh, at this point today. We should all be like that nice uh, museum. What was it, the Cowboy Museum or the Museum of the West where the security guard was your tour guide um, and in his Instagram feed? I love that. That's awesome. I learned so much from museum security guides. They know everything. They know everything. So before we shift into um, this next phase, we did have a question saying, do you have suggestions for dealing with visitor sign fatigue? We found that visitors have just stopped reading the signs and gathering their own information before visiting. So I guess that means they're kind of showing up, waiting for, for feedback. Do you have any suggestions on that, Jane? 
That is so tricky because um, we love signs in museums and we have to change them as capacity grows. Um, there's also paper fatigue, right? Um, all the stuff that, all the pamphlets, but if you have an updated map, I would simplify, you know, with the guidelines on it, that could be something. Um, with staffing, I would say, take the time to train your staff. I know that you may not have the budget to hire more staff to guide people, but then take the time to train the staff you have, the guards, your docents, to take extra time to advise. It, the capacity is limited, so they won't be inundated with crowds, right? So they can have the ability to talk about those guidelines. It's tough. Well, and also to what we said before about accessibility, the presence of a sign assumes that your patron can read the sign, right? Either read the language or has the visual ability to read the sign. So if you have multiple layers um, in your kind of in engagement strategy, there's someone there to reinforce the sign or to communicate what is on the sign if in fact someone not only just chooses not to read it, but maybe can't read it. I think that's an important kind of framing for that whole piece. So, so let's talk a little bit about um, operating your institution remotely. So we've talked about your lockdown plan as it relates to your audience and some programming, but let's also talk about um, the internal operations. And we won't stay long here. I think it's really important um, to just touch on it. When we first proposed the session, many of us were still just figuring out Zoom in our different platforms. That's become more familiar now, but what we have definitely learned is the large majority of cultural institutions, and this includes museums, but is not limited to them, do not have the appropriate infrastructure for their staff to work away from the facility. Either outdated or old tech, or only desktop computers and no good laptop situation, or if they had laptops, not a good back-end infrastructure to connect the two, if you will, so that people could communicate freely, right? Um, so there are some issues that have certainly come up and things that we would suggest. I would say, we're gonna break them down very quickly into kind of three things, your equipment, your systems, and your processes as it relates to kind of the digital platforms that go into the remote operations. First and foremost, and this goes to, actually I should make sure I, I reference it. There is a question specifically in the chat that asked, have you seen museums using docking stations, VPNs, and issuing laptops as opposed to something like go to my PC? I have heard from other industries that this may be more su sustainable for long-term remote work and sharing limited office space, et cetera. And so the answer is we have not seen as much of this as we need to. And that's because the computer purchasing decisions are typically made in place. When we all walked out of offices in mid-March, most folks were like, oh, I'll be back soon. It's no problem, right? And so now that we know this whole thing has changed, what it means now is going forward. So as you all are thinking about rewriting the digital plan going forward, it means that you need to have a serious discussion of are laptops a better fit for your institution? Docking them or just using them completely and not having to buy additional you know, monitors for your staff? And if so, how do you begin to phase them in? I think we were joking earlier that everyone who's ever been like a museum intern or an entry level worker got the computer that was using DOS or something, right? Like the tech is not very good. What COVID has certainly shown us is that can't continue to be the case. And so now board members will also have to prioritize as we build our budgets, making sure we have the right infrastructure to support the realities of remote work. Um, this is helpful even when it's not a pandemic. I remember living here in New England, 2015 was it, when every Monday we had a 12 inch snowstorm, right? There's lots of things that can happen where the ability to, to have those computers is important. So um, laptops should be preferred for many people, but they have not been. So we've noticed people have suffered. It means employees have to use their home computers. And what do you do if they don't have them? That's just a question, right? So many people just assume you have a personal computer at home. What if your staff did not? So it makes assumptions that are problematic. And the longer we are working remote, what are we now at month 27? Now you're more and more of the work materials are now on personal home computers and not necessarily syncing and connecting. So that's one thing. So equipment was one thing, making sure there's a capital budget and plan and a replacement budget. So you can't just invest in all new computers in 2021, hurrah, hurrah, and then no one ever can get them replaced. So that's, that's part of it. 
Also systems and systems Jane has talked about when it comes to systems for uh, program delivery, but also which operating systems. Are you guys going into cloud storage or not? Are people using Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever? And how remote and secure is that? Many finance people are deathly afraid of storing anything in Google Drive, and I can't say I blame them. So whatever you guys are setting up in place, how is that handled? And then quickly, as I watch the time, thinking about the processes. Often museums and other cultural nonprofits are afraid to invest in this equipment and give it to someone. What if they don't come back? What happens to it? That's why the backup system is really important to make sure you're retaining the institutional assets, but change your handbook to account for remote work. Change it to allow for any sort of thing like a social media policy that relates to using that equipment. But most important operationally, it's not even digital, but in the execution of it, is everyone should have some sort of kind of hit by the bus manual that makes it really clear how people do things in their work because there's always that one person who keeps having to go into the organization every week or so because the one thing that you can't operate remotely is the US mail, right? So there has been from our research always somebody who has to go in and check on the mail and if you have um, you know property space and collections who also has to do that check as well and so how does that all get set up so um, there's a broader conversation we could have about managing your team remotely and doing all of that but i think the other thing i would just add as i transition back i think is we have learned that it's really important that you communicate to your audience how to reach your team um, if your phones don't roll to cell phones so if you're going email only but people have varied work hours just to jane's point being very clear is a program live hybrid or virtual only is a staff member available between this time and this time you know how often can they expect a reply and so forth so i went very fast so we can go back to the other fun stuff jane oh uh, just a point about those old computers you might want to keep one or two around to test out some of your virtual programming and see how that runs for a visitor who might be on an older system. So there's oh. a use. Yeah, no, that is a good point. I love that. It's a, and I would just say for everyone who's thinking about this, this is, this, is, this is your critical issue. If you don't have the systems in place, the next time there's a problem, uh, it's gonna be even harder because now there's less and less available computers. If you had needed a laptop in August as all the kids went back to school, they were all literally sold out. Chromebook had like, a, what was it, a two month backup? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and the kids, um, you know, some of the kids are using your colleagues' uh, up-to-date laptop or computer to do their schoolwork. So it's all happening at the same time during the workday. So true. That is so true, Jane. Good point. All right. All right. Did I cover all so those? Then, um, yeah. Yeah. All Perfect. right. Um, so then getting to just looking back on what you have, assessing where you are with virtual content. Okay, so we're kind of summarizing. This is collected information from all the different arts industries we've been scanning. And we've been scanning every few months because changes are happening. Um, so, you know, when patrons pay online, we definitely notice certainly most of the virtual content is offered for free. That's available. That's a great thing. Um, we're no noticing that, you know, less of than 10% is paid artistic or educational content. In fact, I think the most popular category across industries was summer camps um, for kids. That was certainly something across the board, at least at $20 per session, there was something available uh, for paid. Um, and then with online pricing, please notice that if you are um, offering paid content, that it's at a lower price point. Um, you know, it, you can't charge the same thing for an in-person ticket than an online ticket. And you're not going to get the multiple purchases from one household, right? It's one purchase per household. So how we see people navigating that is, you know, you can't increase the price too much. What are they doing? They're bundling everything into subscriptions or packages. Or uh, we saw uh, one um, opera that was um, for a limited time only, just like how we have exhibitions opening and closing for a limited time, they increase the price point slightly, or this is on demand, so you can watch it as many times as you need to, um, that can change the price point as well. Um, I've noticed at Montclair Art Museum, they recently launched, um, it's pretty reasonable, a virtual membership 
It's $30 for a whole year. So this is show, showing that they already have a lot of content there for people to access online classes, right? So there we have this. So then there's an interest, at, it's close to the university. So they have a lot of adult classes that people register for and they're getting a steep discount. Um, and then people love this content and you know this, you know, every time you work in a museum, you're like, you work in a museum? They want the behind the scenes tour and the surprises from the vault. They love that. So you think it's not so interesting to talk with the registrar or the lighting designer, but it is. So that's something that you could, you, know, you could produce very easily in your space. And also Phoenix Art Museum, six to $9 monthly subscription. Does that sound familiar? It's like a Hulu or a Netflix, right? So people, it's a price point that people are comfortable with um, on a monthly basis. And that's also uh, a virtual subscription for one person or the whole family. Um, and, you know, please don't forget the new patron engagement. So, um, you know, you could be a museum in a big city that's just saturated with museums and people just don't have a chance to go to you. And now they do, they have more time, but also it's a ge geographic issue. And we have so many international patrons from all over the world um, coming in and people who've never come through the doors of that museum or even gone to that city before taking a look because now it's, you're providing a visual of what to expect. Previously, just one image would, you know, represent an exhibition. Now you're providing a video or a tour and people are really getting a chance to know what you have. Since this uh, session is really aimed at those in kind of marketing or PR, this is a flag for you all to think about search engine optimization, making sure as you're keeping that website clean and focused that you're also making sure people can find you. That's how people from Shanghai find a theater in the middle of Connecticut to enjoy a virtual performance, right? It's all really in that search engine optimization. We have 10 minutes left, okay, uh, nine minutes now. <laughs> right. All right. So we'll be at the end. The last slides is just thinking about what makes you special as an organization, right? Is it your volume? Are people using you as the resource? Do you have an encyclopedic uh, collection? Is it something unique? You're a small space, but you're the only people who have this, or is a unique location. People don't go all the way here to see this museum, but they do, they really have to do this. Uh, visibility, reputation, you are, um, you hold the most important blank, or you have the masterwork collection of this. Um, relationship or familiarity, um, you have a great local collection, um, or people, the artists you're connected with have a great voice in your organization. And just having that reality check with yourself. Um, what is your capacity to capture and distribute, right? So don't think right away of new um, content. Think about the platforms you're using. People happy with them. Okay, what do you already have? What's in your collection, permanent collection? What do you have the rights to reproduce? What's in your archive? Um, what is your capacity with your staff? Um, and also, right, as Wayne is saying, how can you do this remotely? Um, you can't have that team huddle every day anymore. So what, what do you do? How do you, you know, what's realistic for what's, you know, you're capable of? And last, um, I end with a very complicated slide. <laughs> but it's actually um, a model. Uh, it's not to go through all the points, but basically in something I'm happy to talk to you, uh, you further. Um, but it's a, a decision tree based on performing arts model where you start with what do you have, right? We talked about here, some of these qualities and it's kind of like choosing, okay, I have a high volume of content. Oh, I have, I'm a unique, where do you go in that decision-making tree to your final decision of, yes, we need to create online tours of our permanent collection. So then when you're asked by your visitor staff or your board, why you made that decision, there's these steps of what, you assessed of what, you know, where are these qualities you have in your museum and why you moved to that decision versus you had to create an entire new programming series or your decision of, you know, we're not ready to do that yet. We can have one online special event, but we are waiting to reopen because we're still best serving the public in person. So it's basically a way of uh, thinking through this decision making process. It's the ultimate yes, no chart, pros and cons. You have to figure out what works best for each institution. And I would say if anyone's read, you know, the recent museums magazine from the American Alliance of Museums that talked about 
the Corning Museum of Glass, it has a YouTube channel that it, they've monetized and make a lot of money on every year. It's very clear. They talk about the fact that it takes a staff of a couple of folks to produce that content, monitor that channel. You know, it's not as though you can just do anything and put it anywhere and turn it into, into revenue, which is part of this dilemma at this present time. All right, are we at Q&A? We have five minutes left, yes. All right, Jane, so one quick question. I think you know we can both respond to these. Um, are you finding that museums are making more through suggested donations to an otherwise free virtual event rather than selling tickets with a ticket price? What have you found in your research? There's a progression from completely free to, yeah, maybe we should have a suggested donation up there to now there's a model of this, there's not a suggested, this is the, the price. And it could be a low price point with additional suggested donation on top of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say that it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not binary. So it's not as though people tried the program for free, right? And then tried it for a donation and had comparative data. It's been like an interesting mix, right? They've tried some things for free that worked really well and, and others uh, in a very different fashion. Let's see here. Have you noticed, are you noticing that museum directed, the museums have redirected existing staff to do these projects or are they hiring new team members? If existing staff are asked to pivot, have you noticed whether or not aspects of their jobs are taken off their plates, um, et, cetera, et cetera? So I have to be honest, there's been no research I've seen, Jane, you please comment, that helps us understand if team members um, are having work quote unquote taken off their plate. But I will tell you a great example of using existing teams to help do digital content, but also um, back of house digital work was done in Texas. I believe it was the History Museum that's right there in Austin that was able to maintain all staff and furlough no one by deploying them across digital project work, but it was both external facing work and interior work if my memory is correct. But Jane, I, I don't think we've got any research that can actually tell us the other part, have we? No, I mean, in our Monday panel on your museum career, what's next, which was recorded, so you can look that up. Um, we talked about um, a growth in digital strategy, social media positions in museums yeah. that people are hiring. So there are, there are people who are hiring, but I would say most people in COVID have been in a period of such loss of revenue that they've not been expanding as much as we might see going forward. So I guess it's a, so a good positive thing in a dark time is to think that these skills will only be more in demand and people will likely be looking to add them if they don't already have them in their portfolio. But many, many museums, not all, but many museums are at least 50% you know, dependent upon earned revenue. And digital program strategy that we're discussing is not gonna necessarily return all of that revenue, but it can certainly help with engagement um, audience development, and it can convert people to, to contributors, which has been very, very helpful. So uh, let's see, I think we have one last, is there another question that I missed? I want to make sure I didn't forget any. Got that one. Will the slides be available? Well, this is recorded. So yeah, I guess the slides are totally available. You get the whole thing again. <laughs> and I think our voices. Huh? You can get our voices. With our voices over it. Um, and please know that, so we're totally accessible. If you have other questions, there's so many things we didn't cover. We're always happy to, to provide additional feedback and insight. Please know we've done deep research, thanks to Jane's tremendous work on how this monetization, which is one aspect, has gone across uh, the performing arts industries, musical performance industries, as well as museums. Lots of really interesting things to learn. So um, we hope this has been useful and helpful to you all. And thank you so much for being a part of our session. We really, we really appreciate you. Thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you both so much. You're very welcome. Have a good afternoon, everyone.